Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to move this uh, full screen here in just a second. Um, and so, as I've been mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to leave those in there into the, the question panel of the webinar. Um, I have a lot to share, and I'll go fast, but I, I, if you have questions or need clarification, please stop me so I can stop there at the moment as opposed to waiting till the end. Um, that's perfectly fine um, with me. So just a little bit about who I am. Um, who's this ball, the guy talking to you here today this afternoon. My name is Aaron Maurer. I'm an instructional coach for a middle school in Bendorf, Iowa. Um, we are a public school, grade six through eight, about 1,100 students. And um, I have a great luxury as an instructional coach, along with uh, some other coaches, to operate um, maker spaces. And so what I want to focus on today is the makerspace culture and mindset and really challenge you to see if you're ready so i i'm not here to give you a list of tools and things to buy because i think as much as other things that that people want to know those type of things are, are are not going to help you if you don't have the mindset and the culture ready in your school in your classroom whatever the, the location might be and so as we get going, I have a resource file that, that I will share with you at the end that has um, examples to so many more projects than what I'll have time to share for you here today. But this is really what we're after today, is challenging your mindset and the culture, and do you have those components ready? To get to that point, we can start thinking about the tools of vinyl cutters and 3D printers and CNC machines and things of that nature. What I want to start off with is, we need to start asking this question of not how to do school better, but how do we do it different? There's so much focus on, on being better, um, but that is not the end all be all. What we can start to do is, is think about radically shifting how schools look. And we can't just say that different is enough. If we don't have a plan and a guide, then things aren't, aren't gonna work as well. And so we need to take that step back and, and start to ask ourselves, what do we mean by learning? When we think about learning, what does that look like? Uh, when's the last time you actually asked your students, what does it mean to learn? Um, learning and school are different. Education and learning are different. Um, and we need to get to that core answer of what is learning. You know, as we go through, you know, I love this quote that this scandal of education, that every time you teach something, you deprive the child of the pleasure or, uh, and the benefit of discovery. And so, so many times as teachers, we think it's, our job to keep teaching, 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 and giving all these things. But the beauty of that is as a, as a person, as lifelong learners, or as, as a student in the thing, what is that? What, what allows us to do that learning and, and to have that experience? As opposed to just being told all the time, we've got to have that. So there's a fantastic book, Creative Confidence, and I love this, this idea because I think this is an essential ingredient that we need to have in all our classes, not just in maker spaces, but to experience the world that generates new approaches and solutions. And as, as, as a leader, as an educator, you are a leader. You're a leader in your classroom. You're leading 20 to 30 minds all the time in four or five, six periods a day. Do we have that creative confidence to allow people to experience the world to generate new approaches and solutions? And so our job as, as educators isn't to catch up to the status quo. Our job is to help ourselves as all our students create and be that status quo. And that's the beauty of, of the makerspace mindset and culture. It shouldn't just be isolated to a makerspace. Why are these things not being infused into every single classroom? Um, why does that we have to have the space in a school that doesn't feel like school? That's a problem. Um, why is it that, that the makerspace has taken that much momentum? Because there's an opportunity to break away from the mold of school, and that's why it's working. And so we can't wait for instructions. We can't wait for a step-by-step -step approach because it doesn't work. Every, every space is different. Every building's different. Every classroom is different. The financial opportunities are different. So you have to think about what works for you and what are those steps to keep building that momentum. And as you're building that, that culture and mindset, opportunities start to, to unfold for you. And so that's what we really want to be after as we think about these things. Um, I want you to go do that. You know, what would you do if you didn't have the ramifications? I know in education and, and in school, we have so many things where, you know, we, we say we don't have enough time, we don't have enough resources, or we, our class sizes are too big. And, and those are all very realistic things, don't get me wrong. 
But if we could ignore those for a moment, what was it? What is it that you'd want to do? Go do that. That's what makerspace allows to be because a lot of those ramifications don't exist in a makerspace. But we got to be able to push that beyond into the classroom. Why can't we think that way in language arts? Why can't we think that way in, in science and in math and in social studies? That's where we got to get to. So it's living, really living in the white space and now, today. We can't think about how things used to be in the past. We can't think about all the things that maybe we can do in the future because we can't control those time periods. We can control the now. And so when we start with this makerspace stuff, it started very small. We started with a zero budget, um, very limited supplies. We just started going, what can we do? We started with, with cardboard and duct tape, and it built in, and we got some buy-in, and people started to see that. And so then things can build and escalate. But you got to be willing to take that risk and start to push those boundaries a little bit in your classroom. And so I always like to bring this up. As educators, we've, we have adapted to society over time. And sometimes we don't always adapt with society in the classroom. Um, and so think about this financially. 10 to 15 years ago, people, most people were terrified of, of swiping your credit card. It just wasn't something that we were going to do. The idea that some machine was going to give us money was terrifying. We we're going to get ripped off. We we're going to get scammed. ATM, you know, just wasn't the, the, the place to be. And now they're all over um, and, and things have moved on. We have progressed from just cash and checks. Now I, I, I scan my, my phone at Starbucks. I, I scan my boarding passes at, at airports and it's almost more of, of a hindrance to actually have paper money. Um, so we have adapted with society. I don't have time for this video, I'm gonna skip it, but it, I'll share these notes, slide notes at the end. There's a great little piece from the onion that talks about uh, a living history museum of, of blockbuster videos. But let's take it to this step. How many of you have sent an emoji in the last week? I mean, we have grown men sending poop emojis and other sorts of emojis out on their phones to loved ones, their kids, other people. A year ago, no way was that happening. So we've adapted. So why have we not adapted in our schools? And maybe we have in pockets, but not widespread enough. Because if we have, then there wouldn't be so much talk on makerspace. It would just be, this is a culture of our school where we go and create and make and tinker and experiment and play the what if game. What if I do this or what happens if, this, if, if, if I try this? So these things are important, but why is it important? Because the most important commodity we have is the attention of our students. If we have that half second at middle school, sometimes it's a nanosecond or a minute where we have them plugged in, do we have the thing set up at our disposal to challenge them and help them figure out who they are and help them learn. Not rote memorize facts, but actually help them learn how to learn and how to develop skills. That's what we're after. And so as we start to, to change things, you know, society has continued to, to change and adapt. You know, we talk about that the, this generation, you know, the selfie generation and, and they don't understand this or don't understand that and they need this and they need that. You know, really the number one growing selfie market on Instagram is 40 to 50 year old women. Um, and so things are, are changing and, and moving. And the whole point of this is, that, is to understand, are, are, are the educational institutions moving along with it? Um, and that's where the, the mindset and the makerspace piece starts to come into play. And so here are some of the, these problems that we have to think about that, that the makerspace movement can, can start to overcome. You know, that developing these mindsets that we can actually start to do these things. Um, how many times do we actually challenge students to, to make decisions, to challenge them to actually do something with their learning and school skills? So much of school is programmed. We live by the bell. We don't move to the bell. We don't move until there's an adult that tells us what to do. Um, everything, speaking of the bell, there's a bell right there. You know, everything's programmed in school. Jazz band song selections are created by an adult. Athletic plays are called out by an adult coach. School projects are, are laid out by an adult. But the makerspace, the kids are in control. That's why they spend ungodly amount of hours in Minecraft. That's why they spend forever trying to craft their, their 3D print designs. Um, because they have that ownership in it. And that's what we've got to be able to, to think about and uh, be able to 
me to challenge and figure out where that student voice and choice starts to come into play. And so the big problem with redesigning education is that we haven't designed, defined the problem we're trying to solve. I mean, what is it that we're after here? I mean, our goal is, is to get these students ready, you know, as we always say, for the real world. It is not to get them ready, you know, from elementary to get them ready for middle school or middle school to get them ready for high school. Our job is to help them figure out who they are, what their skills are, and what they want to do with themselves. And through that, each level of education helps them dig deeper into those pathways. Um, Why do we need to skip here? And so what happens is we have layers upon layers of patchwork systems that start to overcome. Let's, let's add this initiative on top of this initiative on top of this initiative. And after a while, nobody really knows why we're doing what we're doing. And when that happens, you get a mess like this. This was a, a print from our 3D printer, um, obviously gone completely wrong. And so from that parent perspective, I don't want my own kids to hate school. I don't want them to come home and think that that, that school sucks. Um, I want them to come home excited, jacked up, ready to talk to me about their learning opportunities, things that they've discovered about themselves. Um, and so, like, my daughter is, is a very driven person. She's a, she's a third grader. And every day in her planner, she writes down at our, at our school policies one thing that they've learned. And she's, she's on top of this. Every day she's got something down. Tell me what she learns. This is what happened the other day with my son. He didn't know what he learned, you know, and that's a problem. That's a two way problem. It, the, the ownership is on him that what was he doing for eight hours in a school day that he didn't learn anything. He did not take the initiative to figure out that pathway. On the flip side, what's going on in school where he was not excited and engaged to figure out something to learn that day. It's a two way street and that's where we got to be able to get to. Um, and he's a good kid. So he's not, I'm not here to give you some, some story where he's come from rag to riches or anything like that. Uh, but that's a mindset we have to start to work over. So here's where we are. We're trying to move from this era of consumption into creation. Not only giving students a voice, because a lot of talk about student voice, um, and that's kind of its own separate category in terms of how much do we actually listen, but moving from voice into agency, actually making the kids do something with the ideas that they're expressing. Make them do that. Um, moving from the idea of being robots where everybody turns out the, the same cookie cutter recipe project into being human and giving them the opportunity to explore and showcase who they are they're learning in the ways that they want. And moving from this 20th century model to now. I even hate to say the 21st century because all those skills, 21st century skills, were the same skills needed for cavemen to survive in the prehistoric era. But what are we doing now to get them ready? And so this is an image of the Coffee Chug Cafe. It's what we call the, the, the maker space of, of, of my room. You know, and we've, we've got to get an opportunity where we, we get the community in. We've got to have people see this and understand it. And so this was a, pardon that bell there, Science Fest day that we had. We've had kids from three years old to, to the adults and the parents doing all sorts of things. And it was amazing. And the idea that I share this is that it works for any age. If you can get that engagement and allow people to move in the agency on what they want to do, you can have them hooked. And these, I had people in there literally for three or four hours that never left. Um, that's what it's about. But I want to make something very clear with the makerspace piece too that I think sometimes gets muddled in all of this is that it's more than just STEM and engineering. You know, makerspace, STEM, engineering, college and career ready, are all these buzzwords that, that sell right now. But we shouldn't have to put a label on it. In the end, it's just a great quality of culture that allows learning to happen for both the adults and educators as well as the students. And so this image here that you're looking at is a language arts project. As opposed to writing a rough draft, we made a rough draft. We went through this whole process, and I'll show this in the resource on how to do the whole thing where they were under time limitations to build their stories through symbols and, and limited pieces and sharing pieces, and they had to be able to explain it all. And at the end of the session, they had an entire rough draft of their story built and created. And then they could go into the writing and development. So it just worked a whole different place. And for one day, 
we had some mind blowing images and discoveries and how kids were able to learn. You know, we didn't have one complaint. We didn't have one kid has to go to the bathroom. They were locked in all day long. And this was with eighth graders, the, the age where they think they're too cool for Legos, but they loved it um, because it challenged them in a different way. Um, and so, as we've already talked about this already, if makerspaces are so powerful, then why are they only in isolation? And that's a big idea I, I want to leave you with is you don't have to have this separate space. Yes, it's helpful. Yes, it's a great starting point. But these things should just be automatically embedded in everywhere we teach. You know, the, old, the question that I get asked time and time again, and I'm sure it's what some of you are thinking is, okay, this guy is rambling on and on. I get it. I understand it. But where do I get these materials and resources and money? I know that's always a question that comes up no matter how I try to avoid that question. And I always tell, tell people this. Why spend a dollar on a bookmark when you can just use the dollar? And so in the resource that I'll give you, you'll, you'll see some examples. But you can start off building these types of opportunities on zero money, asking parent donations, asking for old equipment. I always tell people you should never spend money on wire. You can take apart old components. That's a great makerspace activity is, is, is a take-apart station and save all the motors, save all the wires, save all the components. Teach them how to desolder. Teach them how to sort and organize and identify. You know, cardboard is the, the greatest thing ever, and it shouldn't cost you anything. So there's all these little things that you can start to find and build naturally to get the momentum going. So when people go, what's next? You now have a powerful force behind you of students, teachers, parents, and the community that will help you find the financial resources to get to that next step. So, you know, we've been doing the, the duct tape cardboard station now for a year. We need something more. Okay, so what does that mean? Because you're going to have people wanting to talk about it and support it. And so it's not the perfect answer, but it's always a question that pops up, and it's a realistic one. But we can make things happen for next to nothing um, if we're just savvy about it. So the technological change is additive, and so – Kind of the whole point of this thing, it's not about the tools. I mean, I could sit here and I could go through and explain the 3D printers that we're lucky enough to have or the vinyl cutter um, that's basically been running for the last week. But we didn't start there. This was a couple of years in, in, in the process. But we've had to build a culture. We're a project-based learning school. And so as kids go, can I do this? Or I want to make this. Or I want to show my learning this way. We then go to try to find those resources to make it happen. And so the tools don't create the ends. The tools are the shortcut to bring the learning to life. And so I think that's so huge. Everybody wants to start out and buy things, and then they go, well, then what do I do with it? That's a problem. You haven't established a culture and mindset. It's as opposed to going, here's what we have. How do we get this done? Now there's a need. You know, it's very much like trying to go one-to-one -one in a school. You have to change the, the, the pedagogy and how classrooms operate if you want one-to-one -to, -one to actually work. And so I love this piece here. Um, this was my daughter back when she was in kindergarten uh, or first grade. If I were president, the first thing I would do is wake up. The idea here is that you have to start small, which we've talked about already. Take those first baby steps. You know, create some little stations that maybe you're already doing. You know, taking that uh, just a table full of cardboard, a table full of duct tape, and the only rules of the kids are to make something. Hey, Aaron, we have a question. I'm going to interject real quick. The question is, how do you get teachers to buy into makerspace classrooms over traditional classroom settings with desks and chairs? <laughs> so this that is more a, about the teacher buy-in. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that is a fantastic question. Um, and that's something that, that, that we're actually working with through right now. Um, we've got teachers that have embraced it fully. We're lucky. I was, a little context for us, which I know not everybody has, is so as instructional coaches, we're, we're full-time support for teachers. We're also a volunteer system. And so what we've had the luxury of doing is we'll work with teachers on their projects. And so if we know that a kid wants to do something, they'll schedule a time with us, and we'll teach those kids the skills, allowing the teacher to keep doing the 10,000 things that teachers have to do. So we try to help alleviate that where the teacher doesn't have to be the master of it all, 
but we're there as their support. Now, the, the, the quagmire is, okay, so what do we do if we don't have those people in place? What I suggest, what we've done a little bit at our, at our elementary levels, is we've created these mobile maker kits. And so they rotate around. We have uh, a ton of them. And they rotate through our schools. Every six weeks, a school gets two new ones. They're already created. They already have activity cards. Um, and we house those in the library or your media center just to get the, the, the buzz going. From there, I always believe that, that the students are the force behind it because kids will start to ask, why can't we do this in this class? Or you teach them how to do something, and then in the class they go, can I do this? I learned about this in the makerspace. Can I make my project go that way? And, and most teachers aren't going to say no. And so it's a gradual process. It's not an easy process. And I don't think it's fair to say you'll get everybody on board. But moving it to that grassroots effort, I really think is, it, is important. So much of education is top down. Um, and I think this kind of movement really works from the bottom up, getting a couple of people excited, getting the kids excited, showing them how to kind of make it work and let them bring that into the classroom. And when that happens, I've yet to see a teacher not be impressed. And I, the next step is, okay, so how do I get more of this in my class? And now you've opened up a, a channel to make that happen. Um, and I have some, I just need to, I'll get the, as I already mentioned a couple of times, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, the resource will have some projects, some kits, and all those things to get you started of what goes in there. Um, and anybody that has further questions, they can always follow up via email, and, uh, and I'll help them out. Thanks, Aaron. Um, one other thing that's kind of related to this, another question that popped up is um, about if it can't be an integrated part of the classroom setting at this point. Um, for instance, if it has to be something within the school that's done during lunch and recess, do you have suggestions for supervision or ways for supervisors to start learning about ideas that may get work, work in a dynamic environment? Yeah, so a couple things. Um, I, obviously, every building culture is a little bit different, but um, our media specialists are the key. I mean, that's where makerspace has originated. We're, we're in the libraries. You know, how do we get more kids in? How do we get them more involved? Um, so a couple options that, that have worked in, in our community, in our area. One, if you get your media specialists on board, um, they can be the ones that can moderate that, kind of like a book club. Um, they can do that. Something that's really important, too, if, if your school allows it, is parent volunteers. There are so many parents that are so knowledgeable. The amount of engineers or the amount of, of parents that are good with craft skills or, or any of those things, and you email them out and go, would any of you have any ideas that you'd be willing to work with kids? And more importantly, would you be willing to help run a session over lunch? The amount of outpouring um, is amazing because there's so many parents that – they, they want to help schools, but they don't know where to get started. So here's a great opportunity. What are you really good at? And then you can have a sign-up sheet uh, where kids can come in and sign up. Um, and with that, I think maybe I want to go off topic here just a little bit, but I'll come back to where we are that I think is important, is that we make sure we get every kid an opportunity. Makerspaces and these opportunities are not just for an extension. They're not for the kids that just get done with the work early. We have to make sure that every kid is getting these opportunities. Um, because if we start to level it and decide who can go in or can't, then it's, you've lost the idea of the whole culture of a makerspace. Um, and so we've got to make sure that as you, as you figure those things out, obviously you're starting small, but you have to navigate in a way to bring more people in. Um, so if you get the parents going and your media specialist, heck, even your administration, to come in and just observe it's amazing how contagious it is where you can kind of keep that ball rolling. Um, you know, before and after school in Iowa, it gets really cold in the winter. Um, and I have kids that come in my room every day at 7 a.m., 45 minutes before school even starts, and they're just working and tinkering. Um, and the idea is it's all mutual respect. I don't have to watch every step. They just know that if they overstep the boundaries, they're going to lose this awesome opportunity. And knock on wood, I haven't had any problems. You know, and just how do we build that and scale that, you know? Uh, how do we get more kids in after school or during lunch or even during the school day? And so it's, it's, a, it's a process. There's, there's not a one-size-fits-all because I know the dynamics and the opportunities of every school is completely different. Uh, 
but I would love to brainstorm if people need more help with that because our elementaries have gone about it different ways. Our, I was at the middle school has gone about a, a slightly different way due to our schedule and our high school has got a whole different approach uh, to, keep, to get kids involved and, and they all work, but they're all slightly different. So. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes. I still want to make sure we got some time at the end for maybe some more general questions is, um, so I'll talk about this and we'll skip ahead so you can maybe see some examples here is I challenge you to think about what's your wow. Um, so as we start thinking about makerspace and that culture and mindset, start with something that you're comfortable with. Maybe it's sewing or crochet or knitting, or maybe it is the electronic components, or maybe it is just building Legos or, or building models. There is no right or wrong. The idea is to continue to expose the kids to a variety of different things to get them thinking about, wow, I didn't know that, or wow, I really like this. I didn't realize I would like this so much. And just keep building that. The same thing happens in your classroom. Pick that, that subject or that unit or that topic, whatever it is that you have, that you really, really are engaged in. And start to ask yourself, how can I tweak this to make it a little bit more hands-on? What does that look like? So start with you. I know so many times we always say it has to be student-centered. But if the teacher isn't excited and, and jacked up about it, it's never going to get there to the first place. So think about yourself. You know, that's kind of where we started even with project-based learning on a bigger scale is what's your passion and let's build something from there. Um, and so I'm going to skip through here on these slides, but I want to just show you some examples of some things here. So here's one, a little bit more advanced, but to give you an idea of where potential goes. So we went from creating a simple circuit with LED and a watch battery. You just connect the ends and it goes. There's no harm um, to making digital postcards to now we're to a point here where now we're using Raspberry Pi. We're making our own video arcade consoles um, and programming LEDs and making games with scratch. Um, and so the possibilities are endless. This is kind of a more extreme case of kids that got into it, but it just gravitates. It started with literally a 20 second or a 20 cent circuit of a watch battery and an LED light. And then it was like, well, what's next? Well, can I do this? Well, what if I want to do this? And you just keep going. You just keep, what happens next? Let's find out. And I'm just here as a support. I'm not here to teach you. I don't teach these kids how to do any of this stuff, but I'll help you find the resources and the supports and the things necessary to help you reach that point. This one here um, is, is my, my wife. My wife is a teacher as well, eighth grade algebra. And so maybe one of the hardest subject areas to figure out how to incorporate the makerspace culture or the project-based learning culture. Um, and she took her standards um, about domain and range of a function and created vinyl art using the Desmos calculator um, app on the, on the computer. And so these kids created these amazing pieces, cut them out in the vinyl cutter in the makerspace, peeled them, had this awesome display which led into inviting all the parents and the people in. The, the students then taught the adults how to actually do. And it was a, a, a really great experience. These kids were the experts. And so here's a way how we infuse the makerspace element into a math and primarily into a subject, into a subject area where it seems almost impossible um, to infuse those two. Here's just another project taking place next. Um, building a uh, miniature golf course. And so it's, it's, it's scaled from a vinyl art project to a full-out miniature golf course that they're currently working on. Um, here are some fifth graders. We made uh, digital interactive postcards where we used circuit tape and an LED and a watch battery, taught them quickly how to make circuits, and then they created an image on top and layered it where it would light up and you can see all their awesome designs. So this was something that we worked on uh, uh, last week um, for everybody, and it was amazing. And so we just have to have the guts, the heart, and the passion to get going. I think the hardest part of all of this, now we're running these webinars and presentations and, and workshops um, in a variety of locations, is the, the educators have it. They have the skills. They are equipped. They have the, enough things in their room to make this work. The hardest part is to simply start. And that's what we got to do. Just start. Throw some stuff out there and see what happens. Listen to the kids' questions and let that drive the next step. Uh, my room, I, I always say I should take a picture every day because it changes 
daily based on the needs of the kid and the questions that they have, not what does Mr. Maurer want to do next? It's, oh, you want to do this? Great. Let's go do it. Um, and so this is what you got to have. You got to have an idea. You got to have people to work with you, whether it's kids or other adults. You got to have a place to work, whether that's your classroom, a table, the library. Maybe you're lucky to have your own makerspace. You got to have the materials. And then down the road, realistically, um, I'm not here to uh, live in theory land my whole life, but you do have to have money. But let that build. Take care of these other things first. Um, it's amazing what people will donate and give you before you get to that point where you need money. Um, a quick question about um, the watch batteries. There's a question about uh, suggestions for where to get them. Yeah. Um, if you're able to do it, the cheapest is on eBay, and you can buy them in bulk. And so depending on your – on. I like the three volts, and I have this in the in this resource. I'm, I'll, I'll pull it up here um, in the next couple of minutes so you can look at it. The three volts are the best because they power all your LED lights, and they will also power um, DC motors as well. The one and a half volts ones are not as powerful, but you can get more of them um, cheaper. But they don't power the motors as well. So eBay is where I typically go. I would, if you can, I buy them in bulk of like three to five hundred at a time. Um, and you can literally get them um, for just a little bit over a dollar. It depends on if you get on a good deal, about about a dollar to a dollar thirty. You can go to other sites like Adafruit or SparkFun or your Home Depot or Lowe's, but they're, it's going to start costing you um, anywhere probably about two dollars a battery, which can can add up over time. And so I'm always looking on on eBay. Every school's policy is different. Uh, we can't order on eBay, so if I do have a grant, I'll buy them through Amazon where they're, they're more. Uh, so it just kind of depends on how your, your expenses work. But um, eBay is where I, I get most of my stuff. LED lights, also on eBay, because um, you can literally get them for a, a penny a, a light. Uh, if not, then you got to move into Amazon and some other things that do cost a little bit more. Uh, and so, but your your safe one, things at school, now you have to go to a school account if they don't accept eBay, and they don't say they don't accept Amazon, SparkFun and Adafruit um, have a lot of kits and things already pre-assembled for you, but the cost is a little bit more, but it might get you everything you need kind of in, in one big bundle. Very helpful. Thank you. Yep. Um, and so just kind of last year, as, as things build, this here is uh, one of our iFoot robots we just launched and unveiled. You know, it started with this design here. Uh, we just unveiled it to 2,100 people at a, at a museum a couple of weeks ago. Walks and talks, and now we're, we're adding Raspberry Pi. Um, our goal is to swap out the LED eye, eyes with a camera and have them eventually deliver coffee if we get to that point. And so the, the, the opportunities are really limitless as we get going. Um, so <clears throat> let me pull out of here really quick and show you a couple of things on the resource um, guide. And so on my website, go to uh, coffeeforthebrain.com. And if you scroll down on there, there is off to the side, this coffee chug makerspace resource, um, this collection of resources that I use in the classroom. This is the resource when I run my, my workshops um, that has everything in there. It has the projects that we've done. It has a list of resources. It has really small um, activities that cost very little money to get going. Um, all these things that can help you kind of get, get going and establish within your classroom. And so I would start there um, and take a look at, at that. And if there's questions or other things that you need, um, make sure my email is left so you can reach out and I'll follow up with you and, and help you navigate anything you want uh, as, as well as, as we keep kind of moving through this. I know it's a kind of a, a lot to take in. Um, but that coffeeforthebrain.com has about everything that you would need to uh, get started on that make on that makerspace notebook. And so maybe what hey, I'll do, do here have... oh go ahead. Sorry. Do you have on your website the um, 
picture of the bucket storage, there was a request to go back and show that picture. Is that available in the resources as well? Yes. Yeah. What I will do as soon as this is over on the, the main page of that resource guide, I will load up all these slides. And so they'll have access to the slides and all the videos that I didn't show. Um, so they have access to everything, yes. Perfect, thank you. That, those, uh, those, those buckets, um, as, as you, those are just painter's buckets that are really just, uh, they're, they're bolted together and they're just you know angled in the corner of, of, of the room. So it's a really cheap design, but I'll make sure that's definitely there for you. So what I want to do as opposed to just keep rambling on, if you have some time to look at that resource or the other question, I know we've got about five, six minutes. If there's other things that you want to know specifically, or maybe things that even didn't get to that you're interested in, um, maybe we can take these last couple of minutes and, and, and address those. If there are any. All right, I was on mute. Um, nope. There was one question earlier about um, if you can see the makerspace working in a computer lab setting. Yes. Um, now, obviously, depending on where your electronic outputs are, uh, or your outlet, not outputs, outlets, I would create pods. Um, now, every space is different, so uh, it'd be interesting to see. If you could create pods, you can almost create stations. You can have a, a coding station, maybe in the middle of the room, if you don't have computers there, that's where you could have maybe the more hands-on, on-piece. Uh, maybe you have another station, if you say you did have a 3D printer, you could have a couple computers hooked up to a printer, you know, a couple computers hooked up to a vinyl cutter, um, a couple computers that are just for coding, um, and you can just kind of rearrange your room, but in the middle, if it's possible, that's where you have the materials and resources so the computers don't get dunked up. Um, but really starting to look at, at learning spaces, how do you create these small collaborative environments um, with flexible and permanent learning stations? And so some of these stations are they're always there all the time, and other stations you kind of you, you swap out and, and add different elements so it's not always the same thing every day. Um. Here's an FYI from someone that you can get free five gallon buckets from Chinese restaurants because they buy bulk soy sauce. Ooh. So there you go. Hey, <laughs> that's a win. Doing this presentation works. I did not know that. <laughs> and then there's a question about um, management. The question says, I am the LMS at our elementary school. We do makerspace stations. I struggle with the management of it and the maintaining the items do you have any suggestions to help with this <laughs> that is uh it's the big struggle that that i think everybody gets to at, at some point once they get started um i know we're currently in that struggle right now so we have three instructional coaches in our building and, and two of us basically have maker spaces the other coach his is more the woodworking tools they're kind of more industrial type tools um and that's what we see is how do we manage and organize and sort um and I, there's not a perfect system. Um, what I have invested in, and I apologize for this little announcement going on, but um, what I have found to be helpful is I have a lot of plastic bins, and I just try to sort things by, by items as opposed to a kit with a bunch of stuff. So, I mean, as we're getting ready, actually, we're going to run a makerspace workshop here for staff in uh, about, a, about a half hour. We have a plastic container that's only pipe straws, uh, another plastic container that's just full of LEDs, another plastic container. Um, now the containers can start to add up, but we have everything sorted by individual materials. Um, and what's nice with that is we have stations in our room, like we've got bins that are any, any kid or teacher can come in and grab whenever. I, I, I don't care about them in the sense that I need to keep inventory. And then I have a shelf that's off limits that people need to ask permission for. And so we try to balance that up. These are the things that are more expensive or things that I really got to keep a count on. And others are those disposables that when it's gone, we'll just find a way to get more. Um, but I feel like as much as I get excited for the projects, there's that flip side of cleaning and, and maintenance. And it's it becomes a full-time job. Um, I don't think there's any way around it unless – you know, we have unlimited budgets and can hire people to uh, clean up after ourselves. 
one of the things that we're trying to work on as part of that makerspace culture, which is important for kids, is that that piece, cleaning up after yourself. You're going to come in and use these things. The respect is that you take care of it because um, if you can't do that, then maybe this it, it's not a good fit. Something that I know I need to do a better job of. Um, and for the most part, if you just remind kids, they will because they don't want to lose those opportunities. Okay, there's another question about the best. What's the best way to do a summer camp with a makerspace? Uh, okay, so um, I run or am part of this Young Engineers of Today, and it's what we do. We run a actually a semester long course um, throughout the school year in the evenings, and where we do two webinars a week, and every other week we run a lab based on what they've been learning. So they do the learning at home, and then we do the making in person. The summer camp, you just basically wipe out the webinar piece. Uh, we're actually crafting one here um, as we speak. It'll be a four-day one. And each day we just kind of focus on a different little mini project so the kids can walk out every day with a actual tangible creative thing. Um, and so whether that's using the vinyl press and having them design their own t-shirts or um, creating a, a two checker pieces on a 3D printer and then doing casting and molding to create a chess set uh, to doing combat drones um, if you want to go that route or making robotic pumpkins, jack-o'-lanterns in the fall. There's a lot of projects that, that can be done in a three to six hour time span depending on what the summer camp is that every kid can walk out excited um, and still have their own, own flair and, and detail for um, and so if people are interested in that we can we can we'll gladly share kind of how we're structuring things it's not the only answer but we do have those things in place you know and basically you got to cater to your grade levels so what we would offer elementary is going to look different than middle school or high school All right, thank you. It looks like we don't have any other questions. So we were pretty good on time. It's 1244. Unless okay. someone has one last question, I think we'll wrap it up. Awesome. Well, I guess I'll just wrap up. Well, that uh, attendance, thank you so much for uh, taking your time out of your day to listen. If I'll load the slides up into that resource guide as soon as this finishes up. And then if you have any other further questions, feel free to reach out. I'd gladly help in any way possible. Uh, and other than that, I would love to, if you get something going, I would love to hear from you. Always looking to hear new ways how people are doing stuff. So um, hopefully you get out and share because that's part of the makerspace community. It's not always do it yourself. It's, it's, it's do it together. So uh, thanks everybody for your time.